Welcome to the Millionaire University Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Gearin, with you today. And on this edition of the MU Pod, I'm joined by my friend, Eric Dingler. He's the owner of In Transit Studios, a web design and digital marketing business that focuses on small businesses, helping them standing out in the crowd to grow their bottom lines. The best part, guys, Eric's been doing this as a digital nomad for going on the last four years, living in 14 different countries with his wife and four kids, four teenagers, mind you. And Eric is also the host of the Digital Nomad Entrepreneur Podcast. Eric, hop on in here. Welcome to the show, man. It's a pleasure to have you. Hey, thanks, Brian. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I love talking to people about the digital nomad lifestyle. Um, People are surprised when they find out, and I won't say the number yet, but people are really surprised when they find out how affordable this lifestyle really is. Yeah, that's awesome. I can't wait to hear more about it. And honestly, that is going to be the topic of our discussion today, doing a deep dive on how you set your business up to be location independent. And uh, Eric, you and I were talking about this prior, um, myself being more of a homebody. I've traveled traveled abroad. I love to have a good time. Um, I've got four kids at home, uh, four kids under seven years old. I can't imagine being so mobile and so doing everything you need to do to maintain the family, you know, maintain your relationship, uh, maintain your business, maintain your clients and be moving locations like every week or so, sometimes every few weeks. So um, I can't wait to just get curious and hear all about how you do this and run an incredibly successful business uh, while doing it. And also that funds you, you being able to do this. So just really cool. Let's, so let's just hop right in here. Um, Tell us a little bit, let's hear about your origin story. How did you get into the digital marketing field? And then at what point did you and your wife decide that, hey, let's go live in multiple different countries? All right, sounds good. So uh, my first career job was a camp director. So I ran a summer camp. Um, You know, this was back, got started in the the late 90s, early 2000. Uh, And the, the camp needed a website. And so between summers, I learned how to build a website and update it every year and redesign it and just got able to do that and learned marketing that way, marketing the summer camp, growing it from 250 campers my first summer to over a thousand campers the, the year I left. Uh, so we went there. We, that was uh, the, the start of me learning how to do marketing. Then we actually left that went, planted a church, um, and had to figure out how to market that and, and get all that going. And a couple years into that process, my wife wanted to adopt. We had two biological children, and she felt like the next thing we were being called to do was to give a sibling group uh, a forever family. And so we needed to come up with $50,000. And that was not going to be easy on a pastor's salary. And I thought, why not build these websites? And so uh, I put the word out and immediately some guy was like, hey, I'll I'll definitely have you build me a a blog. And I couldn't believe it. I went home and told my wife, I was like, some schmuck is paying me $300 (laughs) to build a WordPress blog. It's so simple. Well, little did I know I was the schmuck at that time. (laughs) I had quickly learned that I wasn't charging nearly enough, but I started building websites and making money to fund our adoption. And then I learned about monthly recurring revenue. And by the time we brought our two older children home from Bulgaria, um, I was the accidental CEO of a web design business. And uh, so we decided to, it funded our adoption plus. And so then we decided, well, what if we helped other people do this? What if we continued the business, started uh, start a nonprofit, fund the nonprofit with our business and help other kids get into Forever Families? Money should not be what keeps an orphan out of a forever home. And so that's what we did. And we installed a new pastor at the church. Um, the church is still running, going great. And I, I just worked on growing my business from there. Okay. Now we got to the point that we were about, we were ready to buy a house. We had been renting up to that point. 
And we met with a mortgage guy and he was like, well, based on your pastor salary, um, which is your most recent tax return plus some side income, he's like, that wasn't really full time. He's like, I can get you about a $250,000, $260,000 mortgage. He's like, but if you wait one more year on your business, I can get you a $450,000, $500,000 mortgage. And we went, we'll wait. That's, you know, we were in Virginia Beach at the time and we we're like, that's a whole lot more. That's the type of house we want here. So we said, we'll wait, no problem. And uh, I went on a one of my morning walks and I got back and I told my wife, I said, I have an idea. You know, now up to that point, my wife had started uh, following van life was a hashtag on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And she was thinking that maybe the six of us could live in a camper van. Um and we even met with a camper van designer and, and kind of mapped it all out. And I finally, though, just had to tell her, like, I love you and I love our four kids, but I can't live in a van with these four <laughs> kids. There's no way. Um, and so I said, listen, we have this four month window from January to April until, you know, um, that we get our taxes and all that done and meet with the, the, the mortgage guy and get approved and find a house. Why don't we just, why don't we go, why don't we just take a test trip and see if we like this digital nomad thing? And so that's what we did. We went, I went to our landlord and I said, I'll either pay you 50% rent uh, for three months or we're going to, we were on a month to month at that point. I said, I'll either pay you 50% rent or we're going to go ahead and move out, put all of our stuff in storage and, and leave. Um, or we may come back from that trip and want to stay for a bit longer. Uh, and he was like, yeah, just pay me 50% rent. That sounds easier. And so that's what we did. We headed to Istanbul for like six weeks and then fast traveled um, Prague to Poland, um, over to France, up to England and, and came home. But about just a few weeks into being in Istanbul, we had a family meeting and we unanimously agreed this is going to be our lifestyle. Went back to the States, sold pretty much everything, and been living out of carry-on luggage ever since and traveling the world. Wow. that's See, to me, again, being a guy who's kind of more of a homebody, that's fascinating to me that you you tested it out, you liked it, and you're like, all right, this is how we're doing it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, where, where was the business at this point? And this, this was back in about 2021, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know... It, it was me and one other person. I, I, I one other uh, team member, full time. Peter, uh, still with me. He's our now our director of web services. Um, he's from Bulgaria. When we were in Istanbul, we actually flew him and his wife to spend uh, a week with us and had our first company retreat in, nice. in Istanbul. Um, and so now there are six full time employees and three part time. And so yeah, so we've been you know steadily growing. I have a great team. They're very patient with me. Um, I'm a new ideas guy and we've, we've redesigned our business probably three times. Um, I think we finally landed on the, where we're going to be for a while. We, we kind of re re we pivoted a bit at the beginning of the year, our business model, and it's been just great and we're all loving it. And I think it's where we're going to stick for a while. So what, so what exactly do you all focus on right now and who do you, who do you help? So our ideal clients are uh, brick and mortar business owners in the United States that are skeptical about digital marketing. Um, they've tried it in the past, they've been burnt or they've tried this and it didn't work. Um, and so we really like coming alongside that skeptical business owner that doesn't want to spend. So we used to be a full service agency. And we were like, we're the experts, we're the doctors, trust us, give us the keys to the kingdom, we're gonna, we're gonna get you all kinds of results. Um, and we did, I just hated it. It was, just, it was a lot of pressure. Um, and, you know, what, which it should be. People were paying us, you know, 2,500, $3,000, $3,500 a month. Um, and so we actually pivoted to being a done with you. So we do, we, we help them come up with a strategy. We still build the website, set up the CRM, integrate everything, build out the automations. We take care of the technical 
And then we train them to take over implementing. And, and then we are partners with them. We have open office hours that all of our clients can come to um, during the week and just pop in and ask questions, uh, get feedback on stuff. We do monthly training events um, and, and things like that. So now we're more of a done, we, we say done with you. We'll handle the technical geeky stuff and get everything built custom to you. And then you get to take it over from there and make sure it's your voice um, you're, you know, it's going the way you want it to go. And we show you how to, to see the results of it. Okay. So, and this is everything from web design to online lead gen. Like what, what are you guys doing? Google, Google ad services, Google yeah. profiles, yeah. Uh, Ab- Facebook. Absolutely. All of it. So, so what we do when we work with somebody is we have what we call the marketing momentum, uh, framework. I'm a big framework guy. I love frameworks. I got frameworks for everything. So <laughs> we have the marketing momentum uh, framework and, and basically it comes down to every single customer, any business is ever going to have is going to go through four different phases. Every time you become a customer of somebody else, you go through these four phases. So everybody starts at becoming aware. Now they can either, it can be self-discovered awareness or created awareness. Marketing is where we can create awareness with marketing, promotion, advertising, stuff like that. Um, and so that's first. We just we have to we have to either make people aware that they want what we have or that we exist for them um, and they need this, or people will discover it themselves. And then people move into the second stage, which is consideration. Well, who am I going to buy from? Um, and you know they where did and then. We ask, okay, where are they turning at this moment? Um, if it's a barber shop, they're turning to Google Maps. Um, you know, if it's a financial planner, they're going to a browser on their computer. So, you know, where where are they going to? Maybe they're turning to a friend, something like that. Um, but where are they going to consideration? Then you have the actual purchase experience. What information are you gathering, and where are you storing that to market to them later? And then the fourth and final stage is advocacy. And here, every single customer is going to be one of three types. They're going to be the uh, raving fan. They're going to be the roaring critic. But the vast majority are going to be silently satisfied. You know, Brian, you and I, we are silently satisfied customers of lots of different brands. Um, Mm -hmm. We use all kinds of companies that we never talk about. But we're, we know we'll go back to them because we like them. Um, but we are, we're just satisfied. But we're silently satisfied. We want to engage those silently satisfied with marketing to help them become raving fans. So what we do is we're like, okay, what, what do you want to do business? What do you, how do you want to create awareness? And, and let's just choose one. Do you, do you want to do Facebook ads to create awareness? Do you want to do display ads to create awareness? Do you want to, um, you know, be a, you know, be out there on, you know, do you want to have a billboard? You're like, how do you want to create awareness? All right. Once people become aware, where are they turning to? Are you the easiest and obvious choice? What are they looking for? What's the consideration? That's your present. Like what's your web presence, your Google, your Apple Business Connect, all of that. Consideration, what information do you need to gather? How do you need to gather it from them? Where are we going to store it? We've got a CRM for that if you don't have it. And then what's all the email automations? that are bringing those customers back, or if you gathered contact information during consideration, you can still be emailing those people to bring them in as future customers. So we we work with them to hit all four of those. And what we do is we have a, a list of things that say, here's all the things that work in awareness, here's what works in consideration, here's what's in purchase, here's what's in advocacy. And then we work with the, our, our clients still pick and choose from those what they like um, and what they're going to do and what feels right to them. Not everybody likes cold calling. So why, why tell them that's the only way to do it? That's not the only, you know, you know, there's no only, this is the only way to do it. That doesn't exist in, in marketing. Um, And so that's, that's our approach. That's our approach. Um, And then once they figure it out, and agree to it, then we connect everything, integrate everything, connect all the dots, and then train, and we create SOPs for them. Um, and then we train them and, and help them use it and then just stay in that partnership relationship. 
Um, we're, and we love it. We love this model. We're having a lot of fun with it. Okay. So you mentioned that it's done with you. So it's probably, I'm guessing a fairly affordable type of subscription, um, service where you set everybody up and you're there to help them when they need, like, we taught you how to do your automated email, but Hey, you have a question, come hit us up in office hours. Or, you know, do I set it on this setting or that setting? They have the ability to reach out to you as part of their subscription. Absolutely. We have 24 seven support in, inside the CRM so they can reach out through that. But then they have office hours in the strategy. They can schedule something if they want to. But our typical customer, um, our typical customer will invest about sixty nine hundred dollars one time setup, and then four ninety seven a month is the the average. Now we have some people that will say we've got this lady. She's she's absolutely phenomenal, and she's just like Eric. I'll be honest. I'm never going to send the. E- I know I should send my email newsletter. I'm never going to get around doing it. She goes, can I just send you the content and you do it? And we're like, yeah, that's going to be an additional, we charge her 35 bucks to, to do it. So because it's, she, and I don't know why she doesn't do it. She sends it all to us, all packed. It takes her more time to organize it <laughs> and send it. But we just literally, within five minutes, we've got it plugged in and hit send. And, you know, we charge her an extra 35 bucks a month to do that. She emails it into the team. They have an SOP to execute on it and, boom, it's, it's just done. So we do, it's very customizable. So some people are like, can you just do this for me? Well, that'd be an additional $200 a month if we do that, you know? Um, and then they're sitting there going, yeah, I'll pay for you to do that. But then it just as, just as often they'll go, oh no, I, I'll do, let me try it to start. And then they find out they can do it. And we're on, like, teach somebody. I can't tell you how many times I've, we've got, probably a dozen at this point, business owners who have their, you know, 14, 15, 16 year old kid at home doing some of these things behind the scenes. Cause I'm like, my own kids help me with my business, <laughs> get your kids to help with them, pay them a little bit of money. Like it's a, it's great. And so that's, that's how, that's who we like to work with customers that own, like we like working with the owner. Uh, and so, yeah. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So this sounds like a business that's perfectly tailored for the nomad lifestyle. Um, how did you, did you have any, any apprehension to leaving home, leaving your home base and, and running this business, not just running it, but also growing it. You know, in my opinion, I know here at MU, we think that if you're not growing, you're dying, right? This stagnant business is not, it's not a business that's a safe business. Um, so when you, when you, kind of were like, we're going to move abroad and we're going to make this happen. Were you scared at first about what's going to happen to the business or is this doable? Uh, not on the business side, um, probably because I'm too arrogant and prideful. <laughs> <laughs> and I just I just think I'm amazing. So, on the family side, absolutely. You know, with the kids and is this the best for the kids? And my wife and I still have that conversation from time to time. Like, you know, is this real? Are we still doing what we think is best and stuff like that? Um, so on the business, I, I wasn't. Now, this is why a test trip is so important because I learned when we got to Europe um, that that time zone change or time zone difference was way too much. I, I tried to step away from day to day way too soon. So at the end of the test trip, we never could consider, like when we talk about all the places we were going to go, Central America and South America were never on our list. Um, But after we got back from the test trip, we said, oh, I told, you know, my wife and I talked about it. I said, I need to be in time zone sync for a couple more years. And so we've been traveling in Central and South America for the last couple of years, building the team up. I now have a full-time project manager that's in the U.S. that now has got to the point that after I'm, I'm still wearing the sales hat, that'll probably be the last hat I hand off, um, you know, I slowly as my business is growing, you know, I'm, I'm handing, you know, giving away different parts of it. Um, and you know, project management was the most recent. And now that Katie can handle that and keep that all moving and client onboardings and kickoff meetings and all that, I only need a couple hours now where I have a little bit of overlap with the U S so it's going to work great this time to jump over to, but I'm still going to be a couple years. And that's why we're going to stay in Europe and Africa for a couple years 
And then my goal is by January, my three-year plan says it's January, 2028, and we are moving to Asia because I no longer have to be in time zones, time zone sync with the U S. So that's our current three-year plan. Wow. Okay. Very cool. And so what was it like building your team from abroad? I know, and especially in a digital business, it's, it lends itself to being more remote, even if you just live somewhere in the U S. Um, but what was it like building your team, um, from abroad? All right. So, um, this, this is again, one of those things I didn't know until like three months ago. Um, Mm -hmm. so I, I was doing some one-on-one coaching now with some folks that are, you know, one, they want to do this, you know, so this lifestyle. So I've been doing some one-on-one coaching and two of the guys were ready to start hiring a team. Like they had reached that point. And I was like, okay, great. Like put a job description together, post it on Upwork, start doing some interviews. And I gave them our whole system. We do, you know, we, we, we hire slow, fire fast. We do three interviews. Um, different people do different, you know, like, you know, I do, a, I, I interview for character the character of the person, um, and to make sure they're a culture fit, then their direct leader does uh, a competency interview. And then somebody else on the team does a third interview to see if the person's a good chemistry fit, because those are the three things we evaluate on character, competency, chemistry. And before I had a team, I had colleagues that did those interviews for me. Um, because when I interview somebody, I do too much of the talking. I just want everybody to work for me. Because again, I think I'm freaking awesome. <laughs> um, and so I needed other people to be helping with those interviews. Well, and so I told them this and they're just like deer in headlights and just scared to death about the whole thing. And I couldn't figure out why. And I was telling my wife, it's like, I can't get over why these guys are scared. And she goes, well, Eric, she's like, you've hired hundreds and hundreds of employees. And it dawned on me when I ran the summer camp, every summer I was hiring summer staff. And so that is just a skill set through 15 years of building a staff for the summer that I don't even put thought into. That's one of those things that has become autopilot for me. So building a remote team for me because of that previous experience has been very, very easy. We have a great system. Um, We... You know, so we hire everybody through Upwork and I pay them through Upwork for the first two years because I don't have to deal with any, um, sis, you know, any pain, you know, like now we have to, we pay into the Bulgarian tax system and social security system for Peter and all of that. Um, but new employee, I don't want to deal with that for two years. If you're still with me at two years, we'll move the relationship out of Upwork and make it official and I'll get set up to do things in your country. But until then, Upwork. Well, when we post a job on Upwork, we hide two trick questions. Um, well, not trick questions. We hide two assignments in the job description. And the first one says, um, when you reply to this job description, copy and paste this as the first sentence. And only about 20% of the people do that. So we'll post a job on Upwork, and the next day I'll have 30 responses. And most of them, I just click the thumbs down because the very first sentence is not from the job description. Even though, oh, I read the job description. I think I'd be amazing for this. I'm perfect. And I'm going, you're you're either a liar or you're an idiot. And Mm -hmm. I don't have time for either one of those on my team. Um, And then in the essential functions, we say, you know, and when you reply, let us know your favorite candy bar. So then we look for those two things and only people that do those two things even are considered for an interview. So for me, having that stuff already in place, it was real simple hiring a team, onboarding. We have a, um, it's all self onboarding for new hires. We, we have a scorecard. It's an Excel document and I've created videos. Um, and I just created them. I created some of them when I hired Peter. Um, and now it's just a new hire gets access to their, their scorecard and spreadsheet, and they have to go down through and watch all these videos. And then we use, um, our project management system and, uh, is we use hive. And so we have a list of all the hot, the training videos for hive. Um, you know, like every soft, like any SAS or any software has got their training university, 
Mm-hmm. We just make all new hires watch all of that. We I want them to have first generation training. Um, and it's what's neat about that. I know we're a little off topic. Sorry. What's neat about that mm-hmm. is what happens is somebody will watch those and they'll be in a team meeting and somebody will say, well, how and they were like, well, why don't we just do in my or you know, in Hive, why don't we just do XYZ? And we'll sit there and go, it does that now? Because I don't read the new feature email that comes out every week. Um, and so that's <laughs> and so sending people back for that first generation training is is really important to us. Um and so my team, their first two weeks of training, nobody on my team is spending time with them. We can keep working. You self-onboard yourself, you, yourself following this scorecard, um, and then you're ready to just be a part of the team and be making things happen. So that was all very natural to me. So now, so with that, I would say it's not it's not hard to hire great remote staff. You, you bring them on for a test project. We always do test projects, you know, part of the interview process. Just sit down, have a process, bring people through it. And it's really not that hard. And they're an amazing team. Or there are agencies out there where you can pay them to handle this for you. They have VAs, they'll they'll interview you, they'll get to know you. And so that's kind of what I tell people now. Like if it scares you, if you feel overwhelmed by it, just you use an agency that does this and let them help you hire your first one or two people until you get comfortable with it. Okay, I like that, and that's <clears throat> I think that's good uh, good advice. Whether or not you're you're a nomad, just in terms of being a business owner, and it's one of those things where if you can if you can afford it, you can pay for uh, the shortcut. There's people who know how to do it. Just just go ahead and jump in, right? Yeah. Just do it. If you can't um, afford the shortcut, you can't afford the salary. <laughs> right. That's the other thing. You know, because most of them, it you know, it may be for an international employee. It, you may be looking at two months of their their that, but you know, you you can get the money um, and do it. But because if you're like, oh, I can't afford twenty four hundred dollars to have them handle this for me, then I don't know if you really should be hiring yet. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So when, if you're a, an aspiring entrepreneur, you're just about to hop into business and you want to live the the digital nomad lifestyle, do you have to have, I know that obviously there's certain types of businesses that would be really hard to operate if you're living across the world. Um, but uh, for you as digital marketing, have you found, um, or are you part of, uh, or in the know with other digital nomads um, in terms of what type of businesses that can be ran uh, fairly easily from abroad? Yeah, there's a whole slew of them. So I know people, and I work. I work in co-working. I'm in a co-working space right now in Chile, um, and so I meet digital nomads every time we're in a new country and co-working spaces and, and things like that. Um, so you know, there's a lot of copywriters, a lot of a lot of people right now doing things with AI. Um, you know, building AI systems and things like that. A uh, lot of developers. Um, you know, software developers is, is one, a lot of coaches, a lot of coaches, all kinds of coaches. Um, I know people that are yoga and fitness coaches and they're digital nomads because they do all of their stuff via, you know, courses, um, people, you know, membership owners, people that own, you know, online memberships, whether it's a community or a course based men- membership, you know, something like that. Um, even if you own a physical pro, like if you own a box of the month club, you know, well, other people can be boxing that up for you. They should be anyways. Um, and you could be building the membership side of it as, as you travel. Um, so coaches, consultants, uh, I mean, there's, there's, when you start thinking about it, going through it, like there are just all kinds of opportunities. Um, I know a doctor, I know, I know a couple nurses, that are all nomadic. Um, and so, yeah, I met a therapist and it does all of their therapy now via telemedicine. And so they, they jump around. Um, so yeah, there's, it's, it's very open. It's a lot more open than, than I think some people think. The biggest challenge is if you're going to be a solopreneur, I really would recommend trying to stay in time zone sync with your ideal customer. Um, but yeah, 
So is that, would you say, is that one of the hardest things or maybe one of the more important things that need to be considered um, if you are going to be nomadic? Because um, like you, for you, it sounded like being across the globe where you'd have to be up in the middle of the night in order to work with someone that's working during the day in the U.S., that would be a huge drain physically and mentally. Um, are there any other pitfalls or things that someone should consider before diving headlong into living the nomadic lifestyle? There, I mean, there's all kinds. Of, you've, you've got to figure out your health care. Now, for us, honestly, we just self-pay because outside of the United States, health care is affordable. Um, <clears throat> our uh, daughter woke up one morning. We were in El Salvador. And she came walking out of her bedroom and she's like, something's not right. And we look at over, over at her and the entire side of her face is all swollen. And I mean, we've never seen anything like, like, uh, my wife's like, yeah, that doesn't look good. And so mm -hmm. she took her down to the emergency room. Turned out we had, our children had mumps. Oh. Um, all of our kids have been vaccinated by mump for mumps, but what we didn't know apparently is the MMR vaccine that we have in the United States doesn't cover the strain of mumps in Central America. Oh. Oh. Um, so our daughter had mumps. And so, but my wife took her into the emergency room. The doctor came in, saw her right away. Then the doctor said, I want to get an ultrasound to make sure. And so my, my wife was like, okay, she's expecting to go be sent down to, you know, imaging or something like that. So the doctor walks out, uh, not even a minute later, the doctor comes walking back in, pushing the ultrasound machine, sets up, does everything, does the ultrasound, says, yep, it's mumps. Here's a prescription. Um, they were in and out. The doctor exam, the ultrasound, and the medication was about $95. Wow. Yeah. I mean, we would have <laughs> been hundreds and hundreds of dollars. In, in, in the United States. Um, every time we take our kids to the dentist, the dentist, especially in Central America, South America, the dentist visits are around $15, $20. And what's fascinating is when you go in, it's the dentist. There's, there's not a receptionist and three dental hygienists and this and this. It's the dentist. You know, they <laughs> you walk in and they're like, hi, come on back. And you go in and you say, they do everything, but they don't have any overhead. Because they don't, they, they don't have all that team and everything, you know, because they're just down the earth and chill. And um, so because of it, they can keep their costs real low. And most of these people, a lot of them got their degrees from the States. The the one time we that, that hospital, it was nicer than any hospital we had been in the United States. So we you have to handle health care. It's not that big of a deal. It seems like it if you've never done it. But, you know... Um, so that there, you got you to figure that out. You got to figure out taxes. Taxes is a, can be a thing. Um, and the, the nice thing about it is for us, because we're outside of the United States for more than 330 days, 335 days in a, in a calendar year, um, we pass what's called the bona fide presence test. So our first up to $150,000 is, is not taxable. Um, so we save a buttload of money on taxes, which is nice. Um, mm -hmm. so you just want to make sure you don't get yourself accidentally set up in a situation in another country where you have to pay taxes into that country. Um, you got to watch your visa, you know, how long we don't, we don't apply for visas. We go in on just our passport stamp. Um, I just can't do business in that country. Um, and so, but you have to watch your restrictions and things like that. So there's just some things like that that you have to pay attention to. Yeah, yeah. That, and that'd be, honestly, for me, that'd be one of the biggest things is like, what are all these little things that I just, they're on autopilot here in the States that I wouldn't think about if I were suddenly in a different country trying to do my normal operation? Um, taxes being one of the big ones, uh, healthcare too, of course. Yeah, um, Money. but more. Just money, money. Yeah. like banking. Like, yeah. do you do you bank with an American bank or do you? Yeah, we we bank with an American bank. Now, we have a travel. We have a personal travel credit card, so we get points and stuff like that. That has no international transaction fees. 
Mm. Well, I didn't think about it. And when we left the States, I didn't think about getting a card for the business. I just used my bank card. Well, I learned every single time I use my card outside of the country, I get, I get dinged an international transaction fee. So when we get back to the States in November, I'm picking up a, uh, a business credit card um, that has no tr- international transaction fees. But then in some countries, because for the most part, for the most part, you're just going to pay with your card everywhere you're at. And there's lots of benefits to that and perks and, you know, it's safer. You just want to make sure you have no internet uh, transaction fees. Um, But in some countries, that's really not an option. Um, Either it's a cash base. A lot of places in Peru, they don't take credit card. So you got to have local currency. Well, if you go, if you, if you don't have the right kind of account, if you just use your regular bank account, you could be paying ATM fees every time you grab currency. So it takes a little bit more planning on kind of like our parents used to have to when it comes to like how much cash to have on hand. Um, So it's, it's not as convenient as that. But then you also have to know in some countries like Argentina, if in Argentina, while we were there, if we would have used our credit card, the exchange rate would have been about 950 pesos, Argentinian pesos, 950 pesos to every $1. That was the exchange rate. Um, But if we transferred money from our bank to Western Union, and we went to Western Union and withdrew our money from Western Union, we got the unofficial exchange rate, which was about 1,200 pesos for every $1, which is when you're getting out a thousand US dollars in pesos, that's tens of thousands of additional pay. Like it, it's the equivalency of two dinners out, um, wow. which is a lot, you know, when you're a family of, of, of six. Um, I make a fat wallet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. One time <laughs> we went into this little Western Union and we got out a thousand dollars. And the, week, the reason we got a thousand dollars is because, again, every time you transfer, there's a transfer fee. And I hate fees. And so I'm, my wife does too. So we're constantly trying to figure out, you know, how to do, you know, how to do that. So like with Western Union, your first transaction, they waived the fee. Well, my wife and I both now have Western Union accounts because I got one for the first one. She got one for the second one because I didn't want to pay. We didn't want to pay those fees. Um, (laughs) But we got out it about the equivalency. We we were getting a, a little over a million pesos. Um, side note, the fastest way to become a millionaire is quickly go to another country with a, with an exchange rate. <laughs> like this, all right. right. Um, well, this Western Union gave it to us all in 1,000 notes. So we had a, 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 a little over a million dollars worth of pesos and $1,000 bills. And so my backpack is stuffed full <laughs> of, of bundles of, of cash. And so like, I'm, we're walking back to the apartment and I'm like, like the whole family is around me, like, you know, creating this yeah. zone of safety. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's yeah. hilarious. It was, it was fun. So, but oh, our, wow. our kids were so, we got home and I dumped it out on the table and our kids were like, <laughs> we're millionaires. And I was like, no, your mom and I are millionaires. Yeah. <laughs> You're a pro. I love that. I love that. That's hilarious. Those good old exchange rates. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, so and this is this is my my ignorant question. Do you in all the countries you're going to, do you like are you and your wife, your kids are you fluent in Spanish? Do you need to make sure that you can speak the local lingua lingo or is it where I feel like some people have have said like wherever you go someone's speaking English. W- what's that like? Yeah. Um so we uh when we first started none of us spoke Spanish. Uh Google Translate is really pretty good. Um, except for languages where it's a Cyrillic alphabet. So like Russia, Bulgaria, you know, places like that, where they use a, a they don't use the, the A, B, C, D, E, F, G alphabet that we do from the United States. Um, it, the, the translation is a little bit more rough. Uh, but my wife actually wanted to learn Spanish um, after Peru. And so we went to, we were in, We'd, we'd gone up to Mexico City and then El Salvador. And from El Salvador, we thought we were going to go to Ecuador. And when we were in El Salvador, we met a family. 
And they were like, oh, you don't want to go to El Salvador. You know, you want to go to Costa Rica. And we said, nah, we don't want to go to Costa Rica. And they started telling us all the reasons we should go to Costa Rica. And then the lady mentioned something about she had gone through a language school there. And my wife goes, oh, I think I want to do that. Um, so we checked into it. We were going to do, she was going to do six weeks at this language school. Um, and so we, we heard about it on a Sunday afternoon and two weeks later we were in Costa Rica, you know, even though we had no idea wow. that's where we we're going to be. We ended up spending a year in Costa Rica, which seemed like an eternity to us at this point. Um, and so it went great. My wife now speaks really good Spanish. Um, but in December, we're going to the United Kingdom, so it's not going to do her much good. But she now speaks, you know, really good Spanish. There you go. Muy bien. Yeah. Uh, okay. I sound like a toddler. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Somebody has to. Yeah. So what, bringing this back to the business, what's it like doing um, growing your business? So BizDev, is BizDev changed just because you're a nomad? Or I know it's... Like for me, I'm local, so it's different. A lot of my, uh, probably 60, 40, my business is is local to me. And I know a lot of my clients really appreciate the fact that I'm there. Um, what's that like being the digital nomad? And I know in the grand scheme of things, like there are hundreds of thousands of small businesses that work with other businesses that the most, you know, the closest we're going to get is via Zoom call. Um, but has that changed at all for you since you've gone nomad or what does that look like? Yeah, we've so I've had one person. He was an older gentleman. He was a photographer, um, you know, and he just just as we were getting ready to like he he can't. He's like, I've thought about it. I just can't work with you not being in the country. <laughs> okay, you know, <laughs> see ya. Um, yep. And so that was fine. And I I don't do critics math. You know, ten positive things plus one negative thing to me does not equal one negative mm-hmm. thing. So I, I I just don't really care. Um, and so we've we've only had one person that that's that's been an issue for. Um, honestly, I think because of COVID, everybody got used to Zoom. Everybody mm-hmm. got used to Zoom, and so it's not that it just hasn't been a thing. And honestly, I think our clients like it because. It's quick. We jump on the phone a lot. We text a lot. You know, however clients want to communicate. Like, my, I, I, the beginning of our employee manual is the very first policy is the no policy policy, which says we don't create a policy just because one thing happens, um, and we're very slow to create policies for anything. So, I don't have a set. You know, I know some people like they have a system and they try to force all their clients into that system. We don't do that. Um, Is that going to hurt me and down the road scaling? I don't know, maybe a little bit, but I don't really care. Um, We'll Mm -hmm. figure it out. We'll we'll figure out how to make this work. Um, And so our clients have the access to us they want. um, And most of them are fine because a lot of them, they'll they'll be, I notice now a lot of them, they're at their house when we're on Zoom. You know, and they love the mm-hmm. fact that they can schedule, you know, not every brick and mortar business owner is in their business, you know, Monday through Friday, nine to five. You know, some of them work from home for a little bit. But if the, if I would have wanted to meet with, we would have had to both go somewhere. So mm-hmm. I, that really hasn't been an issue. Now, the business development, it was, it did take me a while to crack that nut, Um I had built my business all through local networking. Um, uh, partnered with a couple of different business associations. Offered to start a podcast for them to for their me- to highlight their members, and then I would they you know I would host it for them. I would go do the interviews and all the work, and they were like, "Really?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I'd love to do it for you." Um, well, that's how I got all my clients because I was going to their business, interviewing them about their business for this business association they were a part of. And we just built a relationship. And by the end of it, they're like, so what do you do now? Oh, I help small businesses with their their websites and local marketing. Oh, we were just talking about. That's how I got my very first 12 clients, um, the Discover OV podcast in, in Ocean View, Virginia. Hmm. And we use this same exact 
um, system today. But now our project manager has a podcast in Kent, Ohio, for Main, it's called Main Street Kent. Um, so anyway, when I left and started digital nomading, I thought, well, I'll do content. Well, content marketing is a lot of stinking work. And um, I I started a lot of content projects, but I didn't finish any of them. <laughs> um, and so after trying that for a bit, um, I thought, well, I'll do I'll do paid ads. Paid ads are a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> Things change a lot. Um, and I don't mind uh-huh. doing it for clients, but for me, I just I started a lot of ad campaigns, but I wasn't finishing them really well. <laughs> um, and I don't want to do cold calls. I, I I don't like getting cold calls and cold emails, so I'm not going to do that. I don't know. I have a problem with people that do choose to do that at their top of funnel activity. It's just not right for me. So I had to figure out how can I get back to networking and referral for this. And we're really finding that LinkedIn is kind of like LinkedIn and being a guest on podcast for our web design, you know, for the agency and stuff like that. Like that's a big way we, that's kind of how we do a lot of our biz dev now making new relationships and then really working to make sure to turn our silently satisfied clients into referral engines, um, having training events that they can invite people to, um, just trying to engage our clients. Uh, and then the last part of it is I realized for our first two years, as I was trying to figure out all the client, re- you know, the, the lead gen side of stuff, we just kept adding services and taking our services back to our clients. And, oh, we now have this. We now have this. And we just kept upselling our own client base um, and just took our clients. You know, when I left the, the U.S., our average customer monthly recurring revenue was $69 a month. That was our, our average MRR per, per customer. We had some above, some, some, some lower than that. Um, now it's seven twenty seven. So that's a big difference. Um, and so that was that was the biggest way I grew my business for a couple of years until I really figured out I had to get back to networking and referral and relational uh, growth. Yeah. And if you'd be willing to share with our audience, what um, where's your business at today? Like how many folks are on your team? What does your, your MRR look like these days? Yeah. So we've got uh, we've got eight on our team. Um, I got so we've got you know, six full time, three part time. So we got nine on our our team. So we're there. Um, our monthly recurring revenue we're sitting right at about uh, about fifty eight thousand. Um, so real comfortable um, with that uh, and things like that. And that's giving us a lot of space to grow because here's the number that's the most exciting. Okay, here's the number that's most exciting. Most people think to live this lifestyle, we need a lot of that. My family of six and I, we live on $8,000 a month. That covers our accommodations, our food, our travel, our entertainment. Um, $8,000 in a lot of countries goes a really long way. Now, when we go to the United Kingdom, we won't be eating out that much in London. London is very expensive. Um, But we all know that. And that's okay. We we go for other reasons and, and stuff, but we won't be there forever. Um, and so to be a, a, a short, short bit. Uh, but this lifestyle is very, very affordable, way more affordable than people think. Because most people think about when they go on vacation and they're like, oh my gosh, that week of vacation costs me, you know, you know, five, six, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars for that one week. Mm-hmm. Plus they have all of their bills at home. We don't have the bill. We don't, we don't, because we change country so much, we just use SIM cards for our phone. Um, my, uh, we spend out of our family budget, we spend about anywhere from 11 to $16 a month to have cell service on wow. our phones. Um, because we just get <laughs> SIM cards and, yeah. and pop them into the phone and that's it. Um, and so, we don't have car insurance. We don't have car upkeep. Um, we we spent we budget about two hundred fifty dollars a month for transportation, and that'll get 
a lot of Uber rides. Uh, Santiago, Chile has an amazing um, bus system and uh, subway. And so, you know, it's easy to get around here really inexpensively. So, yeah, it's it's very affordable. Awesome. Awesome. Well, you're, you're definitely a, um, a great example of someone who can maintain such a robust business and do exactly what you and your wife and your family want to do, which is live, uh, you know, a very different shared experience from many, uh, many Americans. Um, and I think that's, uh, definitely putting you guys in a, a different, uh, different frame of, of living your life in a way that you guys truly want to. And it's funded by having started and grown and maintained this business the way that you want to. It's kind of like you're, you're definitely getting to have your cake and eat it too. And that's one of the big things I want to make sure we share with our audience is that it is totally doable. Uh, and Eric, you're the perfect example of that. So, um, I know I want to make sure, uh, I honor your time here. We're getting, getting near the closing bell, but, uh, one question I have for you, what are your, your top three cities that you've been to? I think maybe many of our listeners would be curious to know what your favorite places are, or maybe a better way to pitch this is if you and your wife decided to settle down in one of these three cities or in of the top three cities, what would those top three be? Okay. So where we would choose to set a little bit different than our fav- my favorites, and all six of us have would answer this question differently. Um, but if we were going to settle down, my wife would love to live in London or around London. She just absolutely is obsessed with it. She she loves it, and that's 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 fantastic. Um, we really really liked uh, Prague in the Czech Republic. Um, our our youngest right now, who's who's twelve, to this day. Uh, well, I, I was, we just did a week in in Bariloche, Argentina, which is the the northern part of Patagonia. Um, and he has now said that that he may like that better than the Czech Republic. Um, but for for my wife and I, London, uh, Mendoza, Argentina, amazing city. At, we did not expect it to be as amazing as it was. We absolutely loved it. Um, would be a great city to live in. And uh, the, the Czech Republic. Some of my favorite cities, Istanbul, Turkey. I loved Istanbul, Turkey. I mean, it was, that was the first place we went to. And maybe it's a little special because of that. Um, anywhere in Eastern Europe, you know, you know, uh, we were in uh, Warsaw, Poland is amazing. Um, uh, 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 Bulgaria, Sofia, Bulgaria um, is fantastic. We tend to live in the, in the capital. One of the things that we, we've, we've learned is that, because we don't travel with a vehicle and we don't want to rent a car, we do rent. We rent cars from time to time. Um, we just don't for for ongoing purposes. But the capital cities, you're going to find a lot of people that speak English in the capital. They're going to have generally the best public transportation, um, or at least really good public transportation. And it's a transportation hub. It's easy to jump out to other places in the country. So that's why we like capital staying in the capital city um, most of the time, or at least starting there and then traveling out from there. All right. Fantastic. Well, Eric, uh, this has been an absolute pleasure. Um, I want to make sure that our listeners can get a hold of you. Uh, you are the expert when it comes to managing a digital business and being able to live that nomad lifestyle What's the best way for our listeners to reach out to you or check you out on the inter- interwebs? Yeah. For this kind of stuff, if somebody's interested in working with my agency for their, their marketing, you know, in transit studios, like you said at the top, but more so if people want to talk the remote business side of thing, the location independent business, even if they don't want to travel full time, they may just like, hey, I want to have the choice to go spend three months in Italy, you know, or maybe, maybe you want to spend you know, the warm, maybe you, you want to avoid snow. So you're going to go to Florida during the winter and go further back up North, you know, during, during the summer, whatever it, whatever you may want to do where, as far as where you live. And if you want to talk about location, independent business, um, D N E podcast.com. So digital nomad entrepreneur podcast, that's my podcast. D N E podcast.com is the best way to find my podcast, my resources about this lifestyle, and um, what I want to do is I do provide coaching and, and stuff like that, but 
um, as a way to say thank you to you guys for having me on a, as a guest. The first three people that reach out and let me know that, hey, I listened to you with Brian, uh, you know, on Millionaire University, um, and I would love to, you know, chat with you. The first three people that do that, I'll do a free 90-minute coaching session with. Uh, what we'll do is we'll figure out where their business is at, where they want to go, um, and I'll help them identify those next, you know, kind of areas they need to fix out, and, and I'll put together a 90-day strategy for them um, out of that. So. Would love to offer that for people to be interested. Awesome. Guys, you heard it here first. Uh, first three people, make sure you grab that 90-minute session. Um, just speaking as someone in the in the same industry as Eric, that is a very valuable 90 minutes that you can have with an expert who's going to pop the hood. Uh, Eric's going to go in there and check out what you're doing and give you suggestions on the best way to move forward. Here's some of the issues you might be having, and um, I can't recommend Eric enough for that. So top three people, the first three people, go get that, um, go take up that offer with Eric. Uh, again, Eric, thanks so much for, for joining us on the podcast today. This was an absolute blast. Thanks. All right.